Well, it is seven, excuse me, 7.34 p.m. on Thursday, May 11th, 2023. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. All attendees who are not recognized to speak are requested to mute their connection for the remainder of the evening or until such time as they are recognized by the chair. And first, I would like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. So from the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Roger, can you hear me? Christian? Yay, there we are. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Patrick Hanlon? Here. Danny Riccadelli? Here. We have you, Venkat Holly? Here. We have you, and Adam LeBlanc? Here. Right, and um, Elaine Hoffman won't be unable to join us this evening. Um, on behalf of the town, we have Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. Good evening. Good evening. And also joining us is Paul Haverty, uh, who's our outside consultant from BBH Law. Good evening. All right. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Uh, public bodies may meet remotely, so long as reasonable public access is afforded, so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it is being broadcast by ACMI. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted, and the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. So starting with, uh, we have several administrative items just to quickly run through this evening. Um, the first is agenda item number two, which is approval of the decision for 90 Brantwood Road. Uh, this was a hearing that was held, um, I believe this one was on April 11th. Uh, the board deliberated, voted, and um, I wrote up the written decision, distributed it to the board for comment. Uh, I got a couple comments back. We distributed a final version this afternoon. Are there any further questions or comments in regard to the um, for approval draft of the written decision for 90 Brant Wood Road? Seeing none, um, may I have a motion to approve the written decision for 90 Brant Wood Road? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I move that the uh, board approve the written decision in 90 Brant, <clears throat> Brant Wood Road. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Riccadelli. A vote of the uh, members present at that meeting. Uh, Roger DuPont. No, Roger dropped off his video. Uh, I'll check back in with him in a second. Patrick Aye. Hanlon. <clears throat> Aye. Ben Kitholi? Aye. Um, Ms. Hoffman's not here. The chair votes aye. Um, I do hope Mr. Mr. Dupo Roger, are you available? Um, so we did vote as a so we it is a it was a five to zero decision. This is just a vote on the written decision. So we have a majority. Um, which I will note. 
that moves us to item three on the agenda, uh, which is approval of the written decision for 11 Pine Ridge Road. Uh, this is again, um, a hearing that we have held recently. Uh, the, the vote uh, for the applicant was unanimous and the decision was written by uh, Mr. Hanlon, distributed to the board for questions and comments, final draft issued this afternoon. Are there any additional questions or comments in regards to 11 Pine Ridge Road? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the written decision for 11 Pine Ridge Road. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Thank you very much. Uh, may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Canelli. Uh, roll call vote of the members present at that. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Aye. Holly. Um, Mr. Riccardelli. Uh, Chair votes aye. That is approved. That moves us to item four. Approval of the decision for 39 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, test, again, test. Hey, there we can hear you, Roger. Um, so the decision, so 39 Sunnyside Avenue was a unanimous decision um, of the board. Uh, we had a written decision prepared by Mr. Hanlon, uh, distributed for questions and comments, final <laughs> issue this afternoon. Any questions or additional comments regards to the decision for 39 Sunnyside Avenue? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the written decision for 39 Sunnyside Avenue. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Holly. Uh, roll call vote of those present. Uh, my hearing? sound went out, both my speakers and my microphone. I don't know. I can hear you now, Roger. So, is there somehow I can? Roger, I can hear you now. Period. Nope. Roger, I can hear you. I think he's sending me a text. Okay, but I cannot hear you. Hmm. Asking him if his system is muted. Um, all right, so we were on, sorry, on 39 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, if we had it was a per, we have a a motion which has been seconded a vote of the board mr hanlon aye mr holly aye mr riccardelli i i can mr. vote dupont? now <laughs> fantastic mr dupont <laughs> yes i all right and just for aye. you i'll go back uh, 11 pine ridge road and 90 brantwood road were you fine with both of those as well yes thank you very much perfect Okay, that brings us to item five on our agenda, uh, the approval of the written decision for 25 Teal Street. Um, again, this was a recent case, um, unanimous verdict from the board. Uh, I wrote up the decision, distributed it for comments, final draft issued this afternoon. Are there any additional questions or comments on the written decision for 25 Teal Street? Steam done, may I have a motion to approve? Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon, and a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the members present. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Hoffman is not present and the chair votes aye. That is approved. Brings us to item six on our agenda. Approval of the decision for 15 Grant View, Grand View Road. Uh, again, a recent case, uh, unanimous verdict from the board. Um, Mr. Hanlon, 
wrote the decision distributed for questions and comments uh, final version issued this afternoon are there any additional questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 15 grandview road seeing none may I have a motion to approve mr chairman so moved second thank you mr handel and a second thank you mr dupont vote of the members present at that hearing mr dupont aye mr hanlon aye <clears throat> mr holly aye hoffman was not there not available this evening uh and the chair votes aye so that one is passed fantastic all right that brings us to item seven our agenda which is uh deliberation on the final decision for a comprehensive permit So turning to the comprehensive permit for 1021-1027 Massachusetts Avenue. At its May 25, 2023 public hearing, the board voted unanimously to close the public hearing for 1021-1027 Massachusetts Avenue. This marked the end of the acceptance of testimony and new information in regards to the project. It also initiated a 40-day period for the board to consider and render a decision. Tonight's discussions and deliberations are being held openly and publicly, but the board is unable to accept comment from the applicant the board's peer review consultants, or the public. On behalf of the board, I ask everyone who is not a member of this board to please mute their connection, turn off their video, and not interrupt the proceedings. I appreciate everyone's understanding. The board will begin its discussion using the draft decision available on the ZBA's website for 1021-1027 Massachusetts Avenue as annotated during the previous meeting on May 25th, 2023. The board will proceed through the draft in the following order. I'd like to start with section one, the procedural history, move to section two on jurisdictional findings, section three on factual findings, then move on to the waivers at the end, and then come back and do the conditions last. Um, and at the end of tonight's meeting, the board may either vote on the final decision or vote to continue the meeting to continue its deliberations. And under state regulations, the board must issue a decision by Sunday, June 4th or request an extension from the applicant to further continue its deliberations. And should the board decide it is prepared to vote on the final decision, there are three votes the board may take. Uh, we can either vote to approve the comprehensive permit without conditions, so just as submitted. We can vote to approve the comprehensive permit application with conditions, or we may vote to uh, deny the comprehensive permit. Uh, for this project. Um, but what we have before us now is the, uh, I will go ahead and bring this up. So this is the draft that we were working on uh, in our deliberations back on the 25th. Um, and so I, there, there's this version and I know I have, there's a also, a different version from um, from the applicant that has some slight differences. Now, I was looking to see if there was a way I could merge them. It does not look like I can. Um, if I merge it, then it automatically accepts all of the possible changes. So. Um, what I may do is just sort of jump back and forth a little bit between the two. Uh, um, let's see if I can find the right version though. Comparison or something. Yes. All right. Okay, so just to confirm, are you seeing a version with a red draft notice diagonally across the screen? Yeah, okay. Wasn't entirely sure how this was going to work. Okay. So <clears throat> this is the version that was with the red is the, the one that was prepared by the applicant. And this version here is the one that, that we were working from. Um, So on the procedural history, uh, yes. I, I think we're, at least I'm only seeing the one version. Did you just switch between the two? I did. Are you seeing one that says draft in gray or draft in gray? gray is the one we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. So I have to, I so if I do this, 
then you see the red. Is that right? We, we see the no, same no. thing no matter what you do. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, now it's blue. Right, oh, well, yeah. I'll stick with the gray. With the one. Okay. All right, so that's blue. But the, do you see it? Does it say draft in red now? No. Now it does. Now it does, yes. Right. No? No, now it, now does. it does. Okay. All right. So this, the red. Yeah, okay. So that's the version that was prepared by the by the applicant. Um, so it's something we can reference, but I think we're better off sort of working from our copy. Um, and then we can come back and, and see if there are pieces here to include. Um, in this section, some the differences are mainly just sort of in how the property is described. And I'm not entirely sure it's that relevant to how we do it. Um, Your screen will flip back to the, the grayed version in a second. Um, so section one is just about the application being filed. Uh, number two is the public hearing was opened on October 18th. Uh, so three is that it's located on the property and we are gonna edit this. Um, it should read 1021, 1027, um, because the the second building is 1025, 1027. So that we want to make sure it's totally inclusive. And it's on one point point uh one point zero eight acres of land located in the neighborhood office B1 district and is adjacent to the residence R6 zoning district. Uh, nearby uses because it's a commercial office, residential uses, including an apartment building a two-family home, and a condominium development known as Millbrook. That is, Millbrook is actually one word. Um, property consists, property says again, that, so the 11% was the number that was provided by the applicant in the last hearing for lot coverage. Uh, significant pavement, so 25%. Our total impervious area of 36%. No stormwater is present on the property. Um, what the applicant provided us. Applicant proposes a 50 home ownership condominium units in a single structure. The minimum 25% restricted as affordable is determined by the subsidizing agency. And the applicant also proposes approximately 1,700 square feet of ground level commercial space. So that was the number that they had asked us to include. Um, and then during the hearing, this is just who were the primaries for the applicant and then the who was present for the board. Mr. Chairman. Um, and, yes, sir. In uh, number eight, I think at the end of the first line, I think you want its principles, plural. Yes, thank you. And then I would just point out that above that, where it says approximately 1,700 square feet of, mm -hmm. of commercial space, later on, there's an actual number, which I believe is uh, 1658. So I don't know how whether that matters, but those are two different numbers, same, same space. Right. And then the applicant had asked us to go with the 1,700 figure rather than, than the 1658. Uh, okay. So that so well, we will provide that. Um, so we should we should just have a standing rule that whenever whenever that comes up, we change it to approximately seventeen hundred. Absolutely. Um, so this is who assisted the board, and then and during the hearing, there was significant public input. The board heard input from abutters and other interested persons throughout the hearing process. Uh, board also heard significant input from town departments, including conservation, planning, community development, engineering division, and transportation advisory committee. Are there any other town departments I should list? All righty. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just meditating on that, but there were at least two 
uh, units. I'm not sure that they're really, they're not exactly mm -hmm. departments. So I leave it to you what how this should work. Um, but we did get something from the Affordable Housing Trust, uh, which was actually a fairly significant letter from Karen Kelleher. And we also yep. got a statement of content of uh, comments for the first time from the Clean Energy Future Committee, which given the importance of uh, environmental and sustainability concerns in this project uh, might might be included as well. I know we also, we had, we didn't have written comment, but I know we had conversations with the police department and the fire department, which we could include. Um, Actually, I don't know if we had contact with the police department. I know we did with fire. And ISD as well. And we did with the tree committee as well on this one. Oh, that's very true. Important early on. Right. Paul, well, is there anything else you can think of we should be including here? Sorry. Um, no, I think that covers it. Great. Thank you. Got to remember to turn off mute. <laughs> uh, so this brings us to the second section, jurisdictional findings. Um, <laughs> So this first part is just sort of that they have met the legal requirements that the applicant demonstrated eligibility to submit an application. The applicant is a limited liability company. They've written to determine a project eligibility from mass housing. The applicant provided a copy of the purchase and sale agreement between 1021 Massachusetts Avenue LLC and MAG Investment LLC that has been assigned um, to the applicant and a copy of purchase and sale agreement between Jonathan Nyberg and Sarah Q. Dolan and MAG investment that has been assigned to the applicant. Um, and so those are included. We do have the, um, I can't remember if we have specifically have the purchase and sale agreements or if we have the um, the mortgages or we have, we have some document from the, from the registry proving that they have ownership. Um, and then part sub D, the applicant return to not more than 20% of total development costs in accordance with 40B and regulations. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I just have a question, and maybe this is for Mr. Haverty, but is the term return, uh, is that sort of defined? Is that a common term that's used in these? Mr. Chairman, yes. Uh, actually, um, the HAC defines reasonable return okay. uh, as, as someone not making more than 20% return on total costs on an ownership project. Okay, so they use the term return itself. So that's correct. I was wondering. Okay, thanks. Right. Um, and 12 is, is the safe harbor provisions, the statutory minima. So at the time of filing, the number of lower moderate income housing units in the town constituted 5.7% for the total year-round housing units in town. Um, I thought I had a more recent version of this. Um, So, Mr. Chairman, I'm pretty, I'm almost positive that there is a more recent version than December 21st, 2020. Exactly. Uh, it's either 2021 or maybe it's 2022, but I, I remember seeing it early this year. Yeah, and that, yeah, I definitely was in an email from, from Kelly Linema, so I will, I will find that and make sure those numbers get updated. Mm -hmm. 
There we go. Okay. Um, and then this is the the one and a half percent information. Um, so I don't know if we want to put forward the number we have or if we want to just say that we did not provide the applicant with written notice. Chairman, I think that you can fine. just state that what we have. I think that's okay. Okay. Uh, then sub C would not result in the commencement of construction. It's not three tenths of one percent of the land there in town or ten acres. Um, did we have an approved housing production plan, but it is not within. We're eligible for certification. Town has not achieved recent progress towards its housing unit minimum. Uh, this originally submitted does not constitute a large project and the application doesn't constitute a related application. So. That, I think that is it for section two. And it qualifies and the board is not as, um, in a position to assert uh, any questions on that section? All right, so that brings us to section three, the factual findings. Uh, so of land, as we said before, this is 1021, 1027 Massachusetts Avenue. A portion of the property is located within the 200 foot riverfront area from Mill Brook. Property is located within the neighborhood office zoning district. In addition to being located next to various commercial uses, the project also about a 12 unit apartment building located at 1033 Massachusetts Avenue, two family dwelling at uh, 1017, 1019 Massachusetts Avenue, and a 100 unit condominium development located at 993, 995 Massachusetts Avenue, Millbrook Condominiums project. It's also less than 100 feet from the historic Highland Fire Station at uh, 1007 Massachusetts Avenue. Mr. Um, Chairman, yes, sir. Uh, just as a, a matter of, of consistency, this largely repeats the information that is included in paragraph four. And uh, okay. I think that uh, <clears throat> that we should, when it comes to Millbrook condominiums, I think that we should use to be consistent on the name of that project in both in both places. And it's more okay. accurate here. So I what that means is using the word condominiums in paragraph four, I believe. Okay. Um, there's also, I know, a historic structure on Brattle Street. I'm not sure if we should list it or not. And I know it isn't a budding structure. Oh, no, it's not in a budding structure. It's on the other side of the condominium. Okay. Um, so then, uh, wetlands applicant proposes work within the outer 200 foot buffer to the riverfront area associated with Mill Brook. Uh, the riverfront area already consists of a degraded area containing approximately 2517, its existing paved parking area. Proposed work includes. 4619 of disturbance, installation subsurface stormwater management infiltration system is also proposed within the riverfront area. Two areas of on-site mitigation are proposed to address the new disturbances to the riverfront area. One to square feet and two creation of a meadow area of 4,000 square feet. This work will also include the removal of trees, the installation of erosion control is great. Um, not sure one of, not sure why it's limited to a bench and not benches. Um, so Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. <clears throat> In line three, it says that the river 
The front area already consists of a degraded area containing approximately 2,517 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, then the next sentence says that there's a lot of uh, degradation in addition to that, which results in a new degraded riverfront area of 2,102 square feet. You would think from that sentence that the second number should be bigger than the first number rather than smaller. And there's so, I'm sure that I, I have no reason to doubt that the numbers are correct, but it, if they are, there's something that needs to be said to avoid those looking like they're in contradiction with each other. Or alternatively, I'm so just definitely, not So the first right. number, and the, well, the, I was going to say the first number and the third number, if you sum those, you get that middle number. Um, and so I think what they're saying is that currently there's roughly 2,500 square feet that's I degraded, see. and that's, that's the parking area. And so now the, they're going to be impacting 4,600 square feet, which includes an additional 2,100 square feet. So maybe if we replace the word new with additional doofuses like me will understand it. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, so at in the third line, after 2517, I think you do need to add the word square feet after. Ah, uh, yes. True. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Is is the um so in the um description of the work, uh it, it mentions the installation of erosion control. Are we talking about permanent er erosion control or is that um the temporary erosion control during construction? <laughs> Everything else here seems to be the finished condition. Uh I don't right. remember seeing anything for for a permanent erosion control it's just the temporary right um i think partly it's the i think they're relying on the planting to be the erosion control yeah oh yeah okay forward. Hmm. But, like i'm also i'm looking at it too it's also it's sort of sequential so they remove the trees they install erosion control they grade yeah. And they install the retaining wall pass benches or fencing. So, okay, I, I, do, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six lines up from the bottom of that paragraph it talks of uh, two areas of one site administrate. Mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's probably meant to be on site. You're right. Project also proposes off-site work within the inner 100-foot buffer zone to Millbrook, consisting of the removal of invasive plants and installation of new native plantings. This work will be conducted by the applicant on the abutting Millbrook condominium property. A project will be required to obtain an order of conditions from the Conservation Commission pursuant to the Wildland Protection Act. Project proposes blank square feet of work within the aura. Um, I need to confirm if I have that information. If not, we'll have to generate it. Um, all work within the aura is limited to the woodland restoration and the replacement of an existing fence. Uh, project's in compliance with Section 25D of the Arlington Regulations for Wetland Protection. Does it propose work consists entirely of woodland restoration and the replacement of an existing fence? And the woodland restoration is cons um, 
The proposed work consists entirely of woodland restoration, the replacement of an existing fence, and the woodland restoration. Oh, no, that's not right. <laughs> I'm trying to get this to be a sentence. Um, Woodland restoration is considered an enhancement of the resource area. Let's do that. Uh, the applicant submitted an impact analysis on the natural and built environment prepared by LEC environmental consultants. Applicant has utilized NOAA 14 plus data for the stormwater management calculations consistent with current best practices. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I have this vague recollection that when this issue first came up in the Thorndike case, the right description of that was NOAA 14 plus plus plus. And we have this in this application here, it's NOAA 14 plus, and there's another place where it's just NOAA plus plus plus. I think that, that all of those things go in, but we should just make sure that, and I think the best way to, a way of doing that is to look and see how it was done in the Thornbike application, because there we did it, we got it right with the, assistance of the Conservation Commission, which is where all this came from to begin with. Mm -hmm. But I'm actually, I've actually think that we have, we may have pulled off uh, the unusual trick of getting it wrong twice. Um, but we, whatever it is, we should, we should just make sure we have the right one. Okay. And I'll, I'll confirm with my notes because I remember having this, this question came up specifically in one of our, um, one of our hearings. I think it was the, the April 25th which... one. Okay. Not finding it quickly in my notes, so I will look through these afterwards. Um, but in the meantime, I'll go ahead and highlight that. Um, moving on to the transportation network, all access to the project will be from Massachusetts Avenue. The project will provide 51 parking spaces for the residential units and commercial space. The project will provide 75 long-term bicycle parking spaces and eight short-term bicycle spaces. Engineering uh, design stormwater impact board engaged, and we did not do floodplain impacts because we are not in a floodplain. Project will connect to the Arlington Municipal Water and Sewer Systems. Uh, approximately 25% of the site is currently covered by impervious service. I thought we had a different number for that up here. So current total for impervious area is 36%. Seven. The project will increase the amount of the site covered by impervious surface to 27.8% of the property. Applicant proposes to mitigate the increase in impervious area through the installation of a full stormwater management system in compliance with the Department of Environmental Protection Stormwater Management Policy based on us here. Calculations no atmospheric NOAA plus plus precipitation data. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, yep, I have succeeded in yes, verifying that yes, it sir. should be NOAA 14 plus. In other words, the first place where it came up it was correct, and here we we just need one plus. Okay, so that is the correct one, okay. and where it appeared earlier, that that was also the correct one. Okay. 
The NOAA 14 plus precipitation data. Okay. Uh, stormwater management is designed in compliance with mass stormwater management standards, suspended cells, removal, infiltration, and detention of stormwater flows. Project is conditioned here and will address the lack of affordable home ownership units in town. Uh, the board finds that the conditions imposed in section four of this decision are necessary in order to address local concerns. Uh, board finds that such conditions will not render the project uneconomic. The extent that such conditions may render the project uneconomic is defined in 760 CMR 5602. The board finds the local concerns outweigh the potential benefits of the proposed affordable units. Board finds that granting certain waivers from local bylaws and regulations is acceptable, even though granting waivers may have an adverse impact on local concerns. Board acknowledges concerns raised by abutters and other interested parties about the project's potential impact with nearby uses. Um, the board has addressed these concerns by the imposition of appropriate conditions. The board further finds that conditions detailed below appropriately address the matters of local concern in the matter that outweighs the regional need for affordable housing. The board finds that the conditions imposed below address local and regional housing needs while properly protecting valid issues of local concern. Um, and then there's a comment here that the applicant had proposed deleting um, I don't really understand why they would want to delete it, but um, Mr. Chairman, the question for Paul. Yes, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you should just ask the question for Paul. I'll come in later. Okay, so we have a sort of a subheading here for civil engineering sites and storm order impact. Should we have a similar one here because it feels like we changed topics between 29, 28 and 29? Or is that just being nitpicky? I mean, it's up to you. You can subhead it any way you want to. So if you feel like providing greater detail as to this particular section is helpful, then you should. Okay. Mr. Chairman? It, it may be that the right thing to do is to step back the other way. The, the heading here is this this section is basically all of our findings. And yeah, we don't have a whole lot. We've got location of project is one heading. Um, but much of what is in that, well, I guess there's wetlands. OK, I, there's more headings than I thought. So the, when you get to 29, you switch to affordable housing. And then 30 immediately hit, addresses to local concern. So if you were trying to bring it down, you might put, put, put the affordable housing as part of the local concerns thing, but the basic theme is local concerns for that, those last several paragraphs. Okay. Which actually does make germane the reason I originally asked for recognition, which is we sometimes capitalize local concerns, which presumably yeah. means that we're following the definition in the regulations, um, but we don't always capitalize local concern or local concerns, which kind of suggests that we mean something different there. And I'm not sure which, which it is, but it seems to me that if we mean something different, we should think of a way of saying it that it would be less confusing. And if we mean always local concern in the regulatory sense, we should capitalize at each place, but using using the same words in both capitalized and, and not capitalized creates a potential confusion that is that seems unnecessary. Okay. Well, I don't actually, I mean, Paul probably knows better than anybody whether, whether we actually are using two different <laughs> concepts here or whether we're not. <laughs> Paul, we can't hear you. Jeremy? Yeah, now Ken. Yeah. Talking about local concerns, you're talking about the regulatory definition and the regulations that should be capitalized. Okay. okay. So, Mr. Chairman, there's one additional thing I, I 
like to assuming that we go another day uh so yeah. i can actually do this on number 29 or excuse me yes it's i think it's 29 um i'd like to add a sentence there that we can draw from Ms. Kelleher's uh, letter to us relating to the extremely low number of affordable ownership units that we have in town, just to emphasize what a big deal this is. I think everywhere else in need local concern is capitalized. Yeah. Okay. Nope. So local needs, I believe, is also a defined term. Okay. So. Before we do conditions, I wanted to review the waivers just because the intent of the conditions is the conditions are there to, to um, mitigate the, the effects of granting the waivers. So I wanted to go ahead and cover waivers first. There we go. Uh, actually, I'll wait for requests. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So uh, while we're looking for this, the, the very first one, waiver, uh, the applicant requests a waiver of the section to allow for the proposed project consisting of... 50 multifamily home ownership condominium units and associated 1,658 square feet of commercial space. Yeah. Um, that raises the approximately 1,700 issue again. But I'm Absolutely. wondering, since we earlier have defined what we mean by project as including these things, whether we couldn't just rely on that definition and not go through the trouble of, of spelling it all out again and risking saying it differently. Mr. Haverty, do you have a view on that? Yeah, again, the project is defined, so there's no need to really restate it. Okay. So I would say to allow the project, uh, to allow the project as proposed. Uh, easy. Um, the number two is the front yard setback, it's going from 20 down to 17. Um, Mr. Number... Chairman, going back yes, to uh, one on the last line, you've got to allow the proposed project as proposed. So I think you just take care of the, uh, yep. take out the original proposed, the initial. Ah, right. <clears throat> and that's excellent. Thank you. Um, and number three, uh, applicant also requests a waiver of the maximum height requirement of this section, which limits the height of a structure to three stories and 35 feet. The applicant requests a waiver to allow a structure containing five stories and a building height of 66 feet, four inches. That's good and clear. Uh, Article 5, Section 552. The applicant also requests a waiver of the floor area ratio requirement in this section, which limits floor area ratio to a maximum of 0 0.75, and the applicant requests a waiver to allow an FAR of 2.0. Let's 
simple. Uh, section Article 6, Section 614. This section requires one parking space per residential unit plus additional off street parking for the commercial space. The applicant requests a waiver to allow a total of 51 parking spaces for their proposed 50 condominium units and associated. There's our magic number again 17. Seventeen hundred square feet of commercial space. I think in total for seventeen hundred square feet of commercial space, I think it's four. It's only four or five parking spaces, so they're really requesting a waiver of like three or four spaces in total. Mr. Chair, may I ask a question about that? Absolutely. Um, so I was looking back because I had written down a different number than the fifty-one number, and the symbol drawing say fifty-three. Mm -hmm. Is that did that change? Um, later on in the process and I just don't remember it. <laughs> no, we've gone back, we went back and forth on this question as to what the actual parking space count is. And I'm let's just do one last dive through the documents, but I know that there was um yes yeah, she, she the it was pretty adamant about a number. Okay. I'm looking at um, sheet six of the the Patriot Engineering um, drawings. The chart there says 53 from the, the latest, what I think is the latest set. Oh, okay. <clears throat> this number was also stated earlier. I just um, took me a little bit of time to find it. Depend where I was remembering it from. So, hey. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Helen. A question for Mr. Haverty. Suppose it turns out that what the applicant did tell us on April 25th is 51. And what they have on their plans is 53. And we can't ask them what they really mean because we can't ask anybody any questions anymore except Mr. Haverty. Um, and I'm wondering what we do about that because it has implications as to what it is we're actually authorizing. So Mr. Okay. Chairman, what what I would suggest is that if you're granting a waiver for to allow 51 spaces and the plans actually show 53, there's really no harm to the board. If you were granting a waiver to allow 53 and it turns out that the proposal was actually 51, then they have to come back for a modification. So basically, the way we say it here trumps the way what's on the plan, because well, I mean, it, both ways. it would not prevent them from constructing fifty-three spaces as shown on the plan. What it does is authorize them to do only fifty-one spaces. That's what the I waiver would allow. I see. Okay. Waiver number. Six. Uh, again, something Article 6, section requires one and a half long-term bicycle parking spaces and one-tenth uh, uh, short-term bicycle parking spaces per dwelling unit. It's the minimum number of required bike spaces without a finding of the special permit granting authority unless physical assistance is provided. The applicant requests a waiver to allow 48 bicycle storage units in the basement and 26 seven unassisted hanging bicycle spaces in the garage. Mr. Chairman? So the 48 spaces in... Yes, sir. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, and I'll, I'll come in in a minute. Uh, I was just going to say the 48 spaces in the basement, the bikes are not... Uh, the bikes are at ground, at the on, on the floor, 
so they don't require being raised. It's just the 27 additional spaces that are in the parking garage that they want to hang on the wall, but they would not have a lift assist system with them as is required by our bylaws. So I have a question as to, are we using the bicycle storage unit term intentionally as opposed to bicycle parking spaces? Because we say 1.5 on the second line, one and a half, mm -hmm. and then down below, we call them storage, bicycle storage units. And I just was unfamiliar with oh. uh, perhaps the section of the bylaw that maybe it used storage unit as well. I think for consistent, we could, we could say by so we could say parking spaces. Um, that would seem more straightforward. And then hanging spaces in the garage. I think adding parking to the. Unassisted hanging bicycle spaces would just make it confusing. And then as long as the board is comfortable with having the bike spaces that are in the garage be unassisted for lifting, then um, we could consider granting the waiver. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? I've been trying to quickly find the right section of the but the way in which this is written, these bylaws do not allow hanging bike spaces to count towards the minimum number of required bike spaces without a finding of the special permit granting authority okay. unless physical assistance is provided. But it doesn't say what that finding is. <laughs> and I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I don't remember, and I'm trying to figure out what mm -hmm. finding the bylaw poses that we that we make, we may be able to make that finding under the bylaw, in which case a waiver is unnecessary. Oh, good point. Okay, current. Six. If you don't see it right away, we can add it to our homework. Well, it should be in Article 6, Section 6. I'm trying to, there's a lot of words in here. I'm trying to find <laughs> Article 6, Section, but it says bicycle parking. No, 6112 is the right one, right? So yeah. I'm close. Well, hold on. There we go. Six one twelve. I don't actually see the well, we can come back to it. Okay, I've got it here. I'll look at it with one eye. But it, it's got to be there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, number seven, so Title Five. So now we're into the town bylaws. We're out of the zoning bylaws. Uh, title Five, Article 16, Sections 2 and 4, Tree protection and preservation. The applicant requests a waiver of the requirement to make a payment to the tree fund for removal of protected trees 
in lieu of the riverfront restoration proposed in the approved plans. Um, so they are doing uh, riverfront restoration uh, immediately adjacent to Mill Brook, which is, which here they're, so they're sort of trying to double count it. Um, they're counting it against the um, Conservation Commission for uh, for the work that they're doing with the aura, but then they're also saying here it should also count um, against the the tree bylaw. So we had I think we had talked to them at one point briefly about they're adding um, they're paying for paying for this and they felt it was you know because of the it being a, a 40B project, they shouldn't have, they, you know, it would be un, in a, an unnecessary burden for them to pay for it. We had asked them specifically if they would be willing to uh, plant additional street trees. Um, and they had, again, said that they thought that that would be um, burdensome to them. Um, but they are, are specifically requesting a waiver from this uh, you know section of our town bylaws and so i guess the question then for the board is what you know do we feel comfortable saying that you know given what they're doing in terms of the restoration of that back area that we're okay with them not paying into the trees fund or are we do we say um you know that they should be doing more in order to be relieved from the requirements of the bylaws <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So on the merits of that, I started off with the idea that that we should not we should not be uh forgiving the fee. They're they're basically taking down everything and including some right. very significant trees. Um I did withdraw from that position in the course of the hearings. And the reason for it was that I became I increasingly uh, appreciated the value of the, uh, in part because of what Ms. Chapnick of the Conservation uh, Commission said, the value of that urban, <clears throat> the urban park in the back uh, and the restoration of, of uh, native species I did was always concerned, as Mr. Moore knows, uh, that the uh, this is only a big plus as long as it survives and actually is is, is established. Uh, and we right. have attempted to address that in another place. Um, but this taking out the but pre predominantly the Norway maples and keeping them away while the new uh, the new woodland uh, uh, matures, uh, if it is successful, will be a major plus for the town and I think would would merit uh, a waiver. So we'll come in other places to conditions that are designed to make sure that the proposal works in reality. But I think that if we make the assumption that it does, that a waiver of the fee here is... is uh, uh, is appropriate and and uh, I would support it. Okay. Other thoughts on this? Mr. Chair. Mr. Cadelli. I I, I uh, agree with what what Pat's saying. Uh, I'm I'm not sure I'm I've come around all the way um, to think that the the waiver is appropriate. I think uh, I, I was just rereading the drawings uh, before this meeting and. You know they're removing 79 trees um, that are established in that back area, um, mm -hmm. and most of what are being replaced are, you know, two-inch caliper trees, which will certainly not. You know, I think it's a great thing for the long term, but those won't be reaching their potential for many, many years. Um, yeah. So it it does make me slightly uncomfortable to say. Well, you can sort of clear cut this whole site and plant, um, you know, more like seedlings or or very young trees um, that would, in the future, um, 
be a benefit to the city, but in the short term, uh, it you know w won't be uh, doing very much in terms of a tree canopy or uh, water management or any of that stuff. So I still think it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. I, I will say that I, um, I know it was asked of the applicant that <clears throat> if they would consider um, planting a couple more street trees along Mass Ave. And, and I, I felt mm -hmm. um, as when that question came up that that would be maybe a reasonable um, way to get around this. And we waive the fee if they're willing to uh, maybe extend their reach along Mass Ave a bit, which this area doesn't have a lot of street trees. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I remember them saying that they weren't um, willing to, to do that. So I, I think, you know, I, I'd love to hear how others feel, but I, I think this one still makes me a little uncomfortable. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So I agree with both Pat and Dan. Um, and when I read this, I just was wondering if we had any senses to what the amount would be that would be required by for payment to the fund because this is a, is this a per inch diameter sort of calculation because it just says you know waive the requirement to make a payment and i had no clear idea as to what we were talking in terms of dollars right so it's it's specifically for protected trees which are trees that are within the the setback so it's it's not all the trees on the site it's just the ones that are fall within the setbacks um, and it is a, it is the, the the price is set by the size of the tree, um, so uh, we can prepare that calculation for next time. Um, if we want to know what that actual value is, we can even a ball. Yeah, I don't know if, yeah, know if they provided sufficient information. Yeah, um, in even their a, plan. I'm sorry. Even a ballpark figure might be yeah. helpful. Um, but it, would you know, does that include the uh, invasive like Norway maples as well that would be in, included in that calculation? Absolutely. Because that gets yep. us back into what, what Pat was saying about how the Conservation Commission thought that it was, I, I, if I'm not misquoting Pat, that it thought it was a benefit to actually get rid of those ultimately and to have them replaced. So I think mm -hmm. it's a little bit of, you know, of, uh, you know, balancing, I guess. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, sir. It would be great to be able to recognize Mr. Moore, but we can't. I was just uh, going to say that. And <laughs> so, but in, in lieu of that, I think we might, this is, this may be one of those places where having a transcript will be helpful. We will can look back and see in the record what we have. My recollection of the street tree conversation is that we were quite taken with that. The applicant, yep. after looking at it, uh, was was very negative. I am not sure that it ever got down to dollars and cents as opposed to we will or we won't do it. Um, mm -hmm. But as I recall, we did link it at dire that directly to the uh, waiver of this of of this fee and we were thinking to ourselves that you know it's one thing to ask someone to pay into a fund that could be spent anywhere it's another thing to ask someone to take an equivalent amount of money and either directly or indirectly because they don't necessarily have the property interest necessary to plant the street trees uh mm -hmm. that but if they could do that that would be to the benefit of of their project uh, and its residents in a way, in a direct way, that is far different from being just in general for the benefit of the town. And that right. kind of a nexus seemed to us at the time to be a reason to be thinking along those lines. And on the assumption that the street trees are not hugely expensive, um, it seemed like a useful addition uh, in return for this waiver uh, a, a useful addition rather than having the sort of blanket can co contribution. Um, they indicated they did not wish to do that. Uh, nevertheless, if, if it's a local concern, it's our local concern. 
And I don't right. think that we are limited and we have not in the past considered ourselves as limited uh, to doing only the things that the applicant is prepared to consent to do. At the end of the day, we may have uh, an appeal or and, and there may be difficulties, um, but we could follow it up on on this ground. I, I, I would be very reluctant to insist on their actually paying the full amount into a trust fund that benefits the whole town. Mm -hmm. But if there were, uh, if as Dan suggests, that there was a way of doing this that could be worked out uh, in a condition so that we can, uh, uh, so that it ties it more closely to this site in this neighborhood, uh, I think that that would be a concern that uh, might overbalance the reluctance of the applicant to uh, uh, to do that. But I would think that we'd need to figure out a way of making that pretty tight. Right. Yeah, I, I sort of felt, feel that, the, you know, a lot of the work that they're doing in Aura, um, you know, in order to get those permits, a lot of the stuff that, that now is becoming this sort of this urban woodland on the, in the back is really a response to that. And then to say, oh, but it's this too, I think I don't feel as necessarily as, as appropriate. And I agree, Pat, as you said earlier, you know, it's, we really felt that adding some street trees really addressed this in particular. And I like the notion of, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we reconsider that and we say to that, yeah, you know, we just be very specific that we would be looking for you know, X number of trees within X number of feet of the project site, and then it, we leave it up to them to determine how that how that happens. Right, and we may need to write in there what happens if they can't get. I mean, I'm I'm guessing I don't really know at this point what property interests they need to be able to execute on that condition. I don't want to make them do something that they can't they can't do mm -hmm. and it may very well be that the town controls a great deal of the property that's there and it's a matter of getting the cooperation of the town uh and i right. think we we need to think we need to think that through and write the condition in such a way that it doesn't impose an unfair obligation on them in case they have a recalcitrant property on them. okay all right so then what's our what's our takeaway on this one that we so, Mr. Chair, it sounds like, uh, yeah. uh, if I may ask Pat, it sounds like, Pat, you're suggesting that we would grant the waiver and then write a condition rather than denying the waiver request and and going from there, correct? Yeah, that would be the way I think about it, is that you'd ultimately grant the waiver, but the reason why, why is the condition which if they satisfy that condition it satisfies what we think we need in order to to make the waiver okay and we could in this in the waiver grant section say that we're you know the board feels that an additional um an additional condition is warranted and refer it back to the condition to those that, that section and then at least it's tied yeah the tie could easily go the other way as well I and mean, in, in yeah. fact it may properly go both ways. When we do the condition, we explicitly tie it to the waiver, hmm. which actually would be a, probably yeah. a pretty good idea to do, period. Okay, uh, number eight, um, wetland protection applicant requests a waiver the procedural requirement of obtaining an order of conditions from the Arlington Conservation Commission, no substantive waivers of the wetland protection bylaw was requested. Waiver denied is unnecessary. Um, pursuant the comprehensive permit, so this is all local permitting requirements. Accordingly, this comprehensive permit includes an order of conditions under the local bylaw. There's no waiver is required. It's simple. Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, sir. Uh, you may have just fixed it, but there was a failure to agree of uh, Bourbon's noun in earlier where. Word is attempting to tell us in the last sentence of se of section eight. There's a little underline there that indicates that there's something oh, okay. wrong, and if you click on that, it'll fix it. But anyway, it should be no substantive be waiver options. was re or no sub waivers were. Yeah. No. So is this a the applicant requests a waiver of the procedural requirements or from the procedural requirements? I'm 
make from works better. Yeah. All right. Okay. Number nine, Title V, Article 15, Stormwater Management. Applicant requests a waiver of the procedural requirements of obtaining approval of a stormwater management plan. No substantive waivers of this article are requested. And then waiver denied is unnecessary, again, for the same reason. I'm not sure. I think maybe requirement should maybe be singular, but. Uh, 10 Arlington Historical Commission. The applicant notes that the structure at 1021 Massachusetts Avenue, it's 1021, oops. 1023 Massachusetts Avenue is listed on the historic structures inventory requiring determination from the Arlington Historic Commission whether the structure is preferably retained under the demolition delay bylaw. The applicant requests that the board determine that the structure is not required to go through the demolition delay process. Board action depends on the report. So <clears throat> the, as these things go, um, the, the Historic Commission did discuss this project um, and they sub we closed the hearing at 7 30 p.m on the 25th and I got the letter from them at 10 30 that night uh so <laughs> unfortunately the official is, is I is not in the record um but we do have testimony from uh from the applicant on the April 25th um sort of spelling out what had hap what happened and basically what the um, the historic commission decided that it should be, it should have a demolition delay, but then they sort of waived the requirement, which is all moot because they're not allowed to act on it anyways, because it's under our jurisdiction as soon as it was fought, as the governance of permit was filed. So, um, I think, and Mr. Mr. Havity can help with this. I think it's this same response here that a waiver is deemed as unnecessary. Um, because it's under our jurisdiction now. Oops. What the right language of this is. How does that look to everyone? Oops, no, I can't see it here. Looks good. Okay. We can move on to number 11. Um, after lighting. So condition E9 states that they're, they do not have any uplighting and they confirmed in the hearing that they have no uplighting. Um, so it seems like this is a, a waiver that they do not need. Um, they,
You can say that. Yeah. Sure. That, so the I and I fees. Um, we routinely grant that because we do not have a, a set. We have nothing in writing in the bylaws that states that we charge I and I fees, so we can't impose it. Um, now the 13 applicant request waiver from the building step back requirements of this section, which requires an additional seven and one half foot step back beginning at the fourth story along the street frontage, um, which we would grant. Um, I'm trying to think, I think that addresses all the, we had, I had, this one we had added, I'm trying to recall if there were any other, oh, that was it. There was one more waiver they needed. Um, oops. Oops. So this would be, um, And I can find the right citation on this. It's in the it's the the noise abatement section that does that says you have to start at eight um, on weekdays and nine on weekends. And they had requested the ability to start at seven, um, and they had said I had asked them if they would be willing, if in exchange for being able to start at seven during the week, whether they would be willing to drop Sunday and Sunday and holiday hours. And they said they would. So that would basically be the the swap that they we would allow them to start construction at 7 a.m. But in exchange, they would not be they would not have any construction hours on Sundays. So I want to make sure we can. So, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. We might do this in a way similar to the one we discussed before. The waiver is the waiver here, possibly with the cross reference to a condition. And then the condition yep. could say explicitly that, you know, in lieu of the applicants doing this, the the uh, board waived the normal requirements of the noise of the noise control bylaw, and I can take the the language from the. I, I'm pretty sure we did the exact same thing at 1165R, so we can I can just take the language from there. Anyone think of any other any other waivers that, that we were contemplating? I don't think so. So, Mr. Chairman, in yes, the sir. absence of that, I have succeeded in finding the right section of the zoning bylaw that uh, deals with this. It's basically subsection ah. that deals with uh, the what is required by the special permit granting authority um and oh okay it's subparagraph f or at least it seems to be the, the case which says that bicycle parking designed in the following matter shall not be permitted okay. unless otherwise allowed by the special permit granting authority upon a finding of unusual circumstances unique to the property and then it lists three circumstances uh one of which none of them are exactly what it is that we have here, but they're clo they're relatively close. Um, and that's all I was been able. So is that still under six one twelve? Yeah, it is the six one twelve F. So there's lots of subparts to six one twelve. This is the only reference that I can find of the special permit granting authority. The three thing, the three things that are listed here are storage that requires bicycles to be lying down or requiring a kickstand to remain upright, bicycles yeah. that must be hung with one or more wheels suspended in the air, which is sort of what they're doing, or bicycles that must be lifted off the ground or floor without any physical assistance. Mm -hmm. And those are all not just not counted, they are not permitted. Okay. 
in the absence of unusual circumstances unique to the property. Um, and I doubt that we would be able to make that finding in this case. So they probably do need the waiver. Okay. All right. All right, well, let's go back to the start of conditions. Okay, so we're at, we're at nine o'clock, we're doing good. Um, I don't know how late people want to go tonight, but um, if we can make some progress with the conditions, that would definitely be great. And then we'll need to figure out uh, when we would want to continue to. So um, why don't we go ahead and dig into conditions. Um, so Mr. Chairman, can I so suggest first something? Under a. Yes, please. Um, as we go through this, I mean, up to now, we've on a number of occasions found relatively small things that we spend time on. Um, and I was wondering if, assuming that we're not going to finish tonight, if we're in a position where when we have what seems to be typos, yeah. uh, you know, things that don't really require discussion, they just require fixing. Uh, if we were to to give the those things to Mr. Haverty and... Uh, he could make a judgment as to whether or not that can just be put into the next draft or whether that is something that he thinks that we ought to be considering because they're substantive. We might be able to yeah. make some progress by not having to spend time on small things uh, and focusing more on, on things that we identify that are larger. If Mr. Haverty thinks that's an appropriate procedure and consistent with our legal obligations, it might be helpful to do that. I, I think that that would be fine. I struggle to imagine what a substantive typo would be. <laughs> I can think. <laughs> I can think of some. <laughs> I'm sure, I could make that kind of a typo. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, I think. I think yeah, that's a, a fine way to proceed. Um, so here, just being a little more, um, more definition about who comprehensive permit applies to. Um, seven five one conditions we constructed in conformance with the plans listed below. Who has prepared them? And, uh, and, uh, by Massachusetts Avenue comprehensive that uh, so this is so now it's just so this is their documentation um the September 19th revisions through April 14th the Mulhern those are the architectural plans um landscaping details um so KZLA, so the landscaping, lighting plans, utility plans, construction management plans, just so that those are all enumerated in. Uh, uh, A3, that the applicant should be a limited dividend entity is required under Chapter 40B and its successors. For uh, A4, project consists of not more than 50 home ownership condominium units located in a single structure and other Amenities as shown on the approved plans. Project cons consists of no more than 96 bedrooms. Project can also consists of approximately seven. So also consists of approximately 1,700 square feet of commercial space on the ground floor. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I have a question about the 96 bedrooms. I don't remember a discussion about that and don't have the remotest idea why it is we would impose that condition uh, particularly. And so if... Uh, I'm looking forward. I mean, it may very well be that that's just what the plan shows, but why we would we would identify that particularly 
uh, seems odd to me and and potentially questionable. So I, I'm fairly confident in that we include this on all of them because it sort of sets a cap on the number of because they're providing a, a variety of one one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units. So it's sort of so the number so the number ninety six comes from them as to the maximum number of bedrooms that they're anticipating. But the yeah the question I I that's fine with me they they can do ninety six I'm not encouraging them to do more. Uh, the way you'd get to beyond that ninety six presumably is by having more you know having two bedrooms instead of one bedroom and or three bedrooms instead of two or one bedrooms and that would right. mean reconfiguring things and putting put making somewhat smaller apartments and so forth um, i can see lots of reasons why they don't want to do that and wouldn't do that mm -hmm. but now that we don't base the parking requirements on the number of bedrooms anymore and we don't want to do things like controlling the number of bedrooms in order to control the possible expansion of the school age population. Um, I don't see why we should call that out. If the the plans show what they they show, and uh, and I don't see any reason why. I mean, I don't see any reason why we should put that make a legal requirement out of it. Yes, I would ask that question of, of of Paul. Is that sort of a typical language to include the number of bedrooms? It is, but it's certainly not a requirement. Okay. I mean, I guess I, I would propose keeping it um, partly because there definitely are on the plans in certain spaces, there are things that are referred to as study and things like that. And rather than have them, you know, rather than have those converted to another use before the the unit is sold um i think it it's a worthwhile uh you know safeguard for the for the board that the property is you know it we are saying it's 50 units but that that you know that it really just constitutes 96 bedrooms why how do other people feel mr chair yeah but I, I agree with you. I mean, I I think that it's useful um, language, as Pat said, you know, even though the parking is not necessarily tied to the number of bedrooms, sort of all the spaces are tied to the number of bedrooms in, in the building, um, you know, bike parking, um, you know, the amount of the amount of open space and amenity that is being provided is all sort of contingent on this. And if I'm just sort of gaming out a scenario, if if um, the owner decided that uh, every bedroom, every one bedroom was sized to was large enough to be a two bedroom, and then later on decided to convert, you might have uh, you know twenty five percent more residents in the building, uh, which I think would be a detriment. So. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Uh, following up on that idea, too, I mean, I think a lot of the times condominium documents themselves don't actually, they, they may state at the end of the uh, condominium master deed what each unit consists of in terms of rooms. Mm -hmm. And, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily binding. And I think that you know, people can do to the interior of their condominium units what they wish, as long as it doesn't involve the structural elements. So, mm -hmm. you know, it might be, as Dan has said, uh, might be useful too, so that you don't have people converting a lot of spaces to bedroom spaces. And the way I've seen it at times too, even though you can go back to the condominium documents themselves, as I see, you know, eight real estate agents um, sort of uh, pumping up the number of bedrooms in a particular unit and counting mm -hmm. spaces which have not actually been designated as bedrooms. So it, it's probably not a major deal, but I don't think it hurts to keep that number there. Well, I just, I would like to just, I, I'm not going to agree with that. 
But it seems to I've I've been thinking my I have a son who's been living for a long time until he recently got a house in the District of Columbia and having a three bedroom apartment with two children who want their own bedrooms. Um, it's tight. Uh, if they had a study or they were able to, to get an extra bedroom out of it, uh, possibly if some unexpected child should come along, uh, I don't see any reason why we should be sitting here with no better reason than just fearing how many people may get, fold, get into this building uh, to tell property owners, in this case, property owners, that they can't. They can't do that in order to meet their own needs. It's, it seems to me that it's a it's a kind of overreaching that we, people sometimes criticize boards from doing. And I I would let the property owners do what they want to and not risk. It. Of course, you know that it won't. Re I at least believe that it won't really be enforced unless somebody is is concerned about that third baby crying too much and. It it's likely to be a quite arbitrary sort of thing, and since it it isn't necessarily room by apartment by apartment, it just will it involve a, a a general difficulty that uh, that I think that we should not reach out to do. Now, of course, you know they are doing the plans, and the plans will show the bedrooms, and the you know without singling it out, uh, it may very well be that that. Uh, uh, that they and is a practical matter. They can't really do much about this anyway. Uh, but singling it out is a problem for me. It's also a problem for me, frankly, that this is exactly what you do when you're trying to control the school population. It's try to get try to limit the number of bedrooms so that smaller families occupy the house, occupy the building, and so they don't generate as much students. And as you know, this is a thing that we are not supposed to be taking into consideration. And I don't propose that we are taking it into consideration because we barely noticed this until now. Um, but it has a bad look to it, and I'm not comfortable with that. Well, I'm fairly, I'm fairly confident we've included this on all the other ones. Um, uh, but I'm so slow at the uptake. Review that. Um, I would be comfortable taking out the specific number and coming up with something that just says that. The units shall be as in the approved plans, or something, you know, something along those lines that just sort of says that, you know, sort of ties the, the number of units to the, because we're tying the number of units to the plans. And I think we, the approved plans give a certain count of one, two, and three bedroom units. And so if we were to just say that, the project, the project shall consist of the number of bedrooms indicated on the approved plans, and we just left it at that. Or is that Pat? Is that still problematic? Well, we've defined the project already, and we haven't used right. the number of bedrooms in that definition. Right. So if we took out the number of bedrooms and we just referred it back to the approved plans. Does that address your concern, I, or is that still too limiting? Well, you know, I, I'm I'm counting and and look and suspect that I don't have the votes for a position, but it seems to me that that it's at least help helpful to me uh, to do that because I think that they basically would be stuck with whatever's in their plans anyway, and it would, as a practical matter, make this less salient. So I can go along with that. Paul, do you have any other ideas? I do see Patrick's point. I do think this becomes an enforcement problem for you if you do try to limit conversion of space to bedrooms. Um, I, I think you are probably better off being somewhat vague, just tying it to compliance with the approved plans um, so that if somebody does want to come in and convert space, they would have to at least mm -hmm. inform the board and get the permit modified. Okay. So if we said that the project shall consist of the distribution of units as presented in the approved plans. 
It's fine. We, I, I, we, we ought to be able to do this without saying what the project consists of, because we've said that before, and I don't want to say it again the other in a way that contradicts it. So now I'm trying to find. So if I if we just said the distribution of units shall be as presented in the approved plans. Yes. That would do better. You may want to go in A5 and put that there should be a minimum of 51 vehicle parking spaces in case the developer was intending to build the 53 spaces. Very well taken. Good idea. Uh, 6% to the revised waiver list submitted to the board and attached here to his exhibit A. The applicant requested and the board is granted those waivers from the bylaw and other local bylaws and regulations as specified here therein. No waivers are granted from requirements that are beyond the purview of 40B 20 to 23. No waiver of permit or inspection fees has been granted. Any subsequent revision to the approved plans, including but not limited to revisions of the final plans referenced below that requires additional or more expansive waivers it must be approved by the board in accordance. All right. Um, decision provide for a submission of plans and other documents for approval. The director, planning and community development, other town departments, the director. So this we are going back and forth. Um, I think we had originally said 45, and then we agreed that we would do 30 specifically because it doesn't say that they have to be done in 30 days, it just says they have to respond within 30 days. We thought that was fine. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I just was, I'm wondering whether, I mean, that this is the way we did this in the um, 1165R uh, and was, we made mm -hmm. it clear this is what we intended. But I wonder if Paul could give us some advice as to whether he thinks that the weight that we're putting on the word responses is sufficiently clear that if a controversy should develop in the future, uh, that we can be confident that uh, the deciding authority would back us up. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't see it ever getting to that point. There's no way a developer is going to take a question regarding the response of the board to the housing appeals committee, because it's going to take them 10 times longer <laughs> to get a resolution that way than it's going to get just working with the board. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too concerned about that language. Okay. okay. Um, eight. Um, what happens if they transfer the project? No provisions of the conference of permit decision conditions will be binding on the successors. A 10 sidewalks, driveways, roads, utilities, strange systems, and all other on-site infrastructure shown in the approved plans of serving the project shall remain private in perpetuity and the town shall not have now or in the future any legal responsibility for the operation or maintenance of the infrastructure including but not limited to snow removal landscape maintenance hydrant maintenance um now we there are no hydrants on the site so i don't know if we want to re just remove that and just say not limited to snow removal and landscape maintenance Eleven, unless otherwise indicated here in the board, may designate an agent to review and approve matters on the board's behalf. Mm 
move on to section B on affordability. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Could I, could I uh, go backwards for one second? Yeah. On the on the, on the parking, um, I just wonder if it would be worthwhile to change um, the language instead of saying handicapped spaces to say accessible spaces, because that's what yep. 521 CMR says. Um, I just I just looked it up. That's why I didn't say it earlier. No, that is great. Thank you. So these are fairly boilerplate. Uh, um, it does age 25%, which is 13, which is the correct number. That is home ownership units. Um, well, units restricted for sale to households earning no more than the maximum allowable household income adjusted for household size as term of a mass housing or any substitute subsidizing agency. Um, applicant shall obtain approval by the subsidizing agency or the affirmative firm housing marketing plan prior to the sale of any affordable units. With initial sale of units in the project, the maximum number of affordable units allowed by law that may be subject to a local preference is 70% if the if approved by the subsidizing agency. The board chooses not to implement any local preference, recognizing the regional need for afford, recognizing the a regional need for affordable housing at Paramount. Um, so essentially what that just means is that the board is not gonna request that the subsidizing agency sets aside a certain number or a certain percentage of units that are affordable specifically for town residents. Um, and so we have on all the ones we've done recently, we have basically waived um, the local preference section. So that's just what that is. And the submission requirements. Uh, prior to any construction or site development activities, um, the applicant shall deliver to the board a check in a reasonable amount determined by the director of planning community development to be used for, for staff to retain outside experts if necessary for technical review and inspections required under these conditions, but at inception shall not exceed $6,500 unless an alternate amount has been agreed upon by the board oh, yeah. applicant. Um, and then they had requested, and we had, I think we had done this previously, we just say outside peer review shall only be used if town staff lacks the necessary expertise to review a particular aspect or aspects of the final plans. So the town will do what reviews it can in-house and if it has to go out of house, it has the option to still do so. Um, and then under B, obtain and file a copy of the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit. Um, so I know there was a question as to whether or not this property was large enough to actually need to prepare this document. Um, but this this does say that they need to do it if necessary. So we I think we're fine just leaving it in. Um, and the board shall also be provided a copy of the stormwater pollution prevention plan submitted along with any required NPDES filing. Um, Mr. Chairman. This is yes, Pat Bingham. Um, so back on A. Yeah. Um, I read this with a, a thought in mind that I didn't have when we dealt with this earlier, but we've made it very clear here that we under, when we originally came up with language like this, we were saying we were thinking very broadly that if a town can do it to whatever the work is that the outside expert yeah. is being asked to do, if the town can do it, then the town should do it. And the applicant should only be able to have to only have to pay when the count, town can't do it. But there mm -hmm. are reasons why the can't, town can't do it, other right. than that they don't have anybody with the necessary expertise. So, for example, mm -hmm. Claire has lots and lots of like, expertise on a zillion kinds of things. And it would be a very difficult thing for the town to prioritize fooling with whatever these things are. Uh, when the person who has the expertise has so many other things that they have to do that it would be unreasonable 
to uh, imagine that that she would do it, even though she conceivably could. And I was wondering if we could maybe, instead of being so clear that the only thing is necessary expertise, if we might make it a little bit broader and say outside peer review should only be used if the town staff uh, is not reasonably able to review a particular aspect so that we have I mean, reasonably able is a more flexible concept and takes into account more reasons why it is that it would that it would not be proper to imagine the town doing doing things in house that 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 they can't reasonably do. Paul, do you have a do you think we could get away with that? Sounds fine. Yeah, because I was looking at it before too and thinking, you know, the, the problem that the department is going to run into is nothing to do with expertise. It has to do with capacity. Um, especially where they're down to at least two staff people at the moment. So I think this works. Uh, and sub C, um, the final engineering drawings and plans, such approval to be that the plans conform to the requirements of the comprehensive permit and incorporate all the relevant conditions here in these having jurisdiction. Applicable sheets of the final plans shall be signed and sealed by the surveyor. Final plans should be submitted to the board at least 30 days prior to the anticipated date of the commencement of building construction or submission. Um, and that 30 was a reduction from 45, which I don't know if anyone has a concern about that. Uh, that brings us to D. Uh, it's the landscaping plan signed and sealed by registered landscape architect depicting the following overall planting plan that includes a demarcation of clearing and the limits of work planting plans for drives showing shade trees and lighting fixture locations um plan of walkways and open space and recreation areas if any prototype planting plans for each area of the property planting schedules tree protection, preservation plans, construction fencing along the abutting property lines, construction details. Um, it's just the, the, the number two, they're the planting plans for drives. We don't have any drives, but we do have, we have a driveway, we have a sidewalk, we have other areas. I don't know if this is, if, Not sure what a better way to phrase that would be. So, yeah, Christian, the, these things are not all. I don't it didn't I don't interpret all of these things as the fact that it's listed here mm -hmm. means that in fact the applicant is going to actually be doing doing anything in a particular category. It's just that okay. if they do. They it has to be shown. Yeah, it has to be shown. Uh, okay. So I wonder. I mean, so I if that's if that's what it's supposed to mean, then I think that we can leave things the way they are, and then they just won't have a drive, so they won't show anything. They yeah. may have fixtures, but because the other thought was just getting rid of the term for drives and just say planting plans showing tr shade tree locations. Uh, no, I think you're right. Let's just leave it. Not worry about it. All right. And for this next one, I need to go back to, so we do have, and the, the applicant has requested that we include in the commission. Um, and so, um, this or here where it's talking about percentage survival and time frames. I, I want to go back and 
make sure that those are specifically in you know agree with the time frames and things that were put forward by the conservation commission um so we want to make sure that those are in agreement um and then sub e so we did have a construction mitigation plan um and that was approved by the town and works with the conservation commission and everyone so i think we're good there So the applicant didn't specifically flag the reference to 45 days here um, as they had everywhere else. Should we leave it as 45 or should we change it to 30? Mr. Chairman, it should be consistent. Okay. It's fully done. Um, applicants should include on the final plans all the various changes that have occurred during the hearing process. These plans should reflect. Oh, there's an extra space. Reflect site plan changes, including but not limited to surface parking, proposed grading, stormwater, garage elevation, other relevant features. Final plan shall show designated snow, snow storage areas. Um, so we have gone around and around with them on that. Um, I do feel pretty strongly it's important that they know where they're going to put their snow. Um, so unless anyone is objects, I want to make sure we keep that in. Mr. Chairman? <laughs> yes, sir. I, this isn't an objection, but in the area that you just deleted, uh, Paul had suggested, I think it was Paul had suggested that uh, they either should show this area or we should have a condition requiring removal of the snow from the site, which I take to be implicitly saying that they won't have a snow storage area on the site because they won't store any snow on the site. Okay. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm completely with every, with you on the fact that this has got to be addressed. Does it need to be addressed by designating, which is the better way to address it here where and if where I don't know that they actually well, which is the better way to address it? it? It might be better to insist that they just remove the snow and they don't store anything on site. I mean, I guess the question that becomes, you know, if they have a if we have a light snowstorm and somebody shovels, they shovel off the sidewalk, does the snow they just removed now have to be trucked away? Like we say, it just has to be removed. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. It should either be placed in designated snow storage areas or removed from the site. Oh, that's good. Okay. The notification to the assessors for addresses and numbers. Uh, prior to the issuance of any building permit, the application shall record the comprehensive permit with Middlesex South Registry of Deeds. Submit to the board and the director of planning and community development evidence of final approval from the subsidizing agency as required by the housing project eligibility letter. Submit to the board a copy of the regulatory agreement and monitoring services agreement for the project execution uh, should, with DHCD shall be complete prior to the issuance of any building permit. Uh, submit to the building commissioner. Final architectural plans prepared, signed by an architect, 
Um, okay. Automatic sprinkler system conforming with NFPA 13. And the fire alarm system conforming with NFPA 72. Can and file with the building commissioner a copy of all required federal, state, and local permits and approvals required to begin construction. Obtain all necessary building, electrical, plumbing, and associated permits yeah. required to begin construction of the project required by state law. So compliance with the requirement is part of the building permit process rather than required prior to the issuance of the building permit. Yeah. Applicant will be responsible for all applicable sewer permit capacity impacts. So not uh, just the I and I fees, which is impact. So uh, okay, here it is. Sorry. Second sentence: Notwithstanding anything herein, the applicant shall not be responsible to pay for inflow and infiltration fees. Perfect. Uh, applicant not responsible for applicable water and sewer system fees. That nine I it, it shall perform additional test pits at the proposed stormwater basins to confirm groundwater elevation. Test pits shall be done during seasonal high groundwater conditions. Shall be witnessed by the town and or its agent. Uh, which us to Mr. D. Chairman, before we go on to D. Sure. I've yeah. I, I guess this is a question for Mr. Haverty, but in, in we've the, what we've just read repeatedly refers to building building commissioner in capital letters, which is not in Arlington the title of the person who function who executes that function. I don't remember whether there's somewhere a definition in this document of what a building commissioner is that that would make that clear. But I'm wondering whether there's anything whether we either ought to say that the building commissioner refers to the director of inspectional services uh, in the town of Arlington, or whether we should use his actual title or whether we don't need to, because in state law, building commissioner is a broad enough term to include everybody who does what building commissioners do. But I know some towns have these and some towns don't, and I don't fully understand what the differences are. The intention is to have the director of inspectional services serve this function. That's what it should state. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so this comes up quite a bit. We should could just do a global search to change those. All right. Right. It shows certificate occupancy if it's structure, specifications, letters to the board, engineer, or to obtain acceptance from the Arlington Fire Department of Testing and all fire protection systems. Yeah. Obtain sewer connection sign off from the Department of Public Works. Prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy for the project, the applicant shall submit final as-built plans. Homeowner Association.
this what is in So in the original, that's going to quickly flip over to the one that's provided by the applicant. So they it's to submit to the board for review by its council a copy of the condemnation mini association master deed and rules and regulations to ensure such documents contain a reference that the condominium is subject to this decision and identify the following continuing conditions after the receipt of an occupancy permit um so i think that this list here is what they a uh, list that uh, the conditions that run in perpetuity um So I don't know if that makes <laughs> back to our document. So yeah, so it's basically the same thing with the little extra it won't have a homeowner association i don't think no but it will have a condo association which will function in a similar yeah. way so i'm uh, i pretty I, I think that paul's comment here is persuasive that I know enough about what it's like to be on the board of directors of a condo association because I've done it for about 30 years in one capacity or another. And you forget everything, really. Uh, and it, nobody kind of remembers what is going on. So that everything that that calls you back to the kinds of things that you should be paying attention to is mm -hmm. helpful. Uh, and that's kind of what Paul's language does. He mentioned specifically a couple of things that that are are discussed in the decision, but really it's emphasizing that all of the conditions that it will be applicable are um, are within what the homeowners association is supposed to be paying attention to. Now, it may very well be that that if we go through this document, we will discover that the list that the applicant has given us consists of not necessarily permanent conditions. They don't have to be permanent, but things where the obligation continues after the the uh, 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 occupancy permit. Um, but I wouldn't be willing to sort of, I wouldn't be willing to commit myself to one particular list without combing through this document to make sure that that list includes everything that we want. Right. And I'm not particularly volunteering to do that. Uh, and basically, if if it does, if a condition doesn't apply, a continuing obligation, the homeowners association or the condo association can properly ignore it. If it does, then I want them to be paying attention to it. And I don't want right. to be at our risk enumerating things. And if I miss something, then there's something the homeowners association doesn't have to do. So I kind of prefer not not being too specific about listing everything that is a continuing obligation. Mm -hmm. So then would you end at the term herein or is there something else you want to include? Oh, I see. <laughs> No, I think that it would be fine ending after her in, although I'd invite Paul to 
I think that was what his recommendation is, and I was happy with it. If if it's helpful to have something more, that would be fine. But I don't see that as necessary. Because I think this additional language was added by the applicant. Well, maybe maybe the concept of ensuring such documents contain a reference that the condominium is subject to this decision. I think that that part is there, and that's a useful sentence. The question is basically identifying the following continuing conditions. That's that's it's that half of a sentence that clause that is giving me a little bit of heartburn. So I guess the logic of the situation is to submit to the board for its review by its council and so forth, a, a copy of the condominium stuff. To ensure that, and then that's where the to ensure part would come in, right? The do yeah. Those documents have to be there to ensure that such documents contain a reference that the condo association is subject to this decision. And then you can go to the at minimum sentence, and then it, that could end with the word herein. I think that that works. Paul, does that make sense to you? So what what am I changing? You're taking the part about insuring and and tagging yeah. it onto the first sentence, and then you're leaving the second sentence alone. All right. Project design and construction prior to commencement of any work on the property, the applicant and the site general contractor shall attend a pre-construction conference. Representatives of the Arlington Fire Department, the Department of Public Works. Um, let's see. Department of Planning and Community Development. Special services ought to be there. And this is where we had language uh, from 1165R about having a po public meeting open to members of the, having a you know open meeting for members of the public. We had specifically done there because of the fact that they were going to be using a, a narrow private way in order to access the the site for construction, which is not the case here. So, um, don't know if we if people feel strongly that we should re require that it be a public meeting or not. I don't think so. Okay. I mean, um, there you had a whole community that was up in arms about it and that needed communication in order to smooth the way. And here are people who are, people are right. interested for sure, but it isn't the same sort of situation. No, agreed. Um, E2, prior to the pre-construction conference, the applicant shall submit a construction management plan for administrative approval by the board. CMP shall provide documentation of various construction-related activities, including um, this is a question about whether we need a neighborhood meeting. I think we just addressed that. The project description, outline of primary construction tasks, project schedule, project logistics, site management, public safety and coordination, and coordination with the town. 
provide advanced email or website information regarding construction activities for public information. Okay, Mr. Chairman, we, yes, we do have we do have a construction management plan dated February twenty second with mm -hmm. with revisions to March seventeenth, um, and I'm not completely sure how that matches up with this list of this list of things, um, but we did go through considerable effort to make yep. sure that the town officials were agreed that the CMP was a sensible thing to do. And I'm a little concerned about requiring a CMP at the beginning and then requiring a different one mm -hmm. prior to a pre-construction conference. And okay. saying that that's just a matter of language for me because I don't do this kind of work. So I don't know exactly what this entails, but many of the rest of you do. And I don't know what degree of confusion there may be in having a plan that we approve at the outset. And then before you have a, a conference just before construction, you have another one with, with potentially a different set of obligations, which may have to, which will either supplement or don't the others. But I, it does seem to me that it, creates a confusion as to what it is people need to do and to what extent they can rely on what they've already done. We could say that the applicant shall submit a copy of the construction management plan. Like we didn't specific, are we specifically Vote into a. It's one thing to approve preliminary plans for the building. It's another thing to approve a specific construction management plan because that's going to evolve as they go through the process. Well, if, they, if they run into something that's not working, they're they're going to need to adjust the adjust it. So, um, so I was thinking. They could say prior to the construction conference, the applicant shall submit a revised construction management plan for administrative approval by the board. Um, and we could just leave the rest of it in there. Um, but these are topics that you know, will come up during that pre-construction conference if they if they're not specifically in the plan already. So should we maybe, the way in which this is all coming up is starts with A2, which is comes up as a definition of what the approved plans mm -hmm. are. And the approved plans include the what is on file with us as the CMP. Um, yeah. And then there's a provision, if they would need to change an approved plan, there's a provision for how to do that. Um, and, right. you know, uh, so... If I'm understanding right, really it's anomalous to include a CMP as part of the list of approved plans. And I wonder if that, mm. if it all should be pulled out somehow separately. I, I, I'm i just not sure. I mean, the, our basic problem is you've got this thing that we've worked on hard and that the town officials have signed off on and that we think that we have an agreement that this is yeah. the thing you ought to do. And to be sure, it's going to be changing and it's more flexible than the number of bedrooms or something. But but at the end of the day, we have to define what the relationship what the relationship is between what we already have, which is reflects a lot of process, and the kind of flexibility that would be expected going forward, so that we don't find ourselves tying our own shoestrings. And I don't know how to do that exactly, but I have the feeling that the structure. Mm -hmm. Is that doesn't make us eat make it easy to do that? Uh, you could carve out and we say could. as a separate thing, construction management, and say this is what we've got, and that's, and say something about what that is, and then have a different provision for how uh, they may amend it over time. I'm not quite sure. These would all be probably minor amendments within the definition in section A two anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, I. I think, and I would I would ask Paul to con concur, but I mean the the highlight the way I've highlighted E two here. I mean, if we were to just remove that, because they've essentially already done that. Yep. 
which is why they wanted to delete that. Yeah. So we just do that, but and then when they have their pre-construction conference, they can discuss the document they already have. Right. And then the new E2, they had asked us to include that part at the front so that we don't just show up on the site unannounced, but that we are allowed to observe and inspect, but not, but to do so, you know, after conversation with them, which is fine. Um, E3 and E4 are just straightforward reiterations of law. Uh, E5, during construction, the applicant shall conform to all local state federal laws and provide advanced notice to abutters for the town's construction control agreement regarding noise, vibration, dust, and blocking of town roads in order to accommodate delivery of material to the site and for other construction staging purposes. Um, and then, yeah, obviously, accept as waived here, and you should definitely add that. Um, So the construction control agreement um, is just basically it's a document that has to be provided to abutters that basically says what's going to be happening and who to come contact if you have problems is the essential part of it. Um, I think E5 is fine as is. He's six appropriate signage. He's seven location of all utilities. Shall be as shown on the final plans. All transformers, other electric and telecommunications and funds shall be included on the final plans. Project shall be all electric, including heat, hot water, and appliances. All right, why do we have a capital A? Oh, because we have a, two copies of it. So I think, oh, this is, <laughs> it's a word glitch. Okay. Um, the project shall be all electric, including heat, hot water, and appliances. A natural gas service is to be provided solely to serve a backup generator for the elevator as required under state law. Are we all comfortable with that? All right, E9, the applicant shall install lighting on the site that conforms to the town of Arlington zoning bylaw and the town bylaw. Lighting shall be downlit, shielded to prevent light spill over onto surrounding properties and comply with dark sky requirements. Management of outdoor lighting shall be the responsibility of the applicant. Um, and that, the, that's the E9 that ties back to the the uh, that waiver that we are all in agreement we're not required to provide. Um, E10 utilities, but not limited to telephone, electric, and cable, shall be located underground. General contractor shall be responsible for coordinating all subsurface work with dig safe prior to commence commencement. Soil material used as backfill for pipes access shall be certified by the geotechnical engineer to the director of inspectional services as meeting design specs as applicable. Applicant shall test the soil during construction to confirm soil types in the areas of the infiltration system. Such testing shall be witnessed by the board's designee. 
All unsuitable material, if any discovered in excavation for the infiltration system, shall be removed and disposed of in accordance with state and local regs. Okay, p.m. Monday through Friday, and between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. on Saturdays. Because it's no longer per the section, it says. So Paul, in this situation where we are granting a waiver from the requirements, we shouldn't, should we still list the requirements or should we do it as we've done it here and just remove it? I would just remove it. Okay. Everybody comfortable with that? All right. Uh, burning of materials. It's all boilerplate. No building area should be left in an open, unstabilized condition longer than 60 days. Temporary stabilization shall be accomplished by hay bales, hay coverings, or matting. Final stabilization shall be accomplished by loaming and seeding exposed areas. Uh, uh, or do we say final stabilization shall be per the approved landscape plan? Or shall be accomplished by loaming and seeding or compliance with the with the approved landing plan? No, you don't want to give them an option out of it. Um, Does it work to say final stabilization shall be accomplished in accordance with the landscape plan or the approved landscape plan? Does that say enough? All right. Chair, yes, sir. Um, maybe it's just my, you know, the architect kicking in. Yeah. But when I read no building areas, I think build building area. Ah. So I wonder if it would be more clear to say site area or no um, area on on the the subject site or something, or just no areas. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that would be fine. All dumpsters and other trash recycling containers serving the project shall be enclosed and covered. Construction dumpsters, the board shall review the dumpster location as part of the approved final plans, if different from what has been shown in the approved plans. Okay, yeah. So they've said they're not providing a dumpster, they're going strictly with barrels. So, um, but this is, this would only apply if different from what's been shown on the approved plans. That's okay. All retaining walls visible from the public way or direct abutters as determined by the Director of Special Services based upon the time of year when such walls would be most visible shall be constructed in an aesthetic manner, specifically a retain 
Specifically, retaining walls shall avoid the use of exposed concrete similar to a foundation wall to the greatest extent practical. And I think that only applies to that one wall that's going to be in the rear of the planting area. Snow shall be stored within the areas of the property designated on the approved plans. To the extent snowfall exceeds the capacity of the designated snow storage areas, the applicant shall truck the excess snow off-site. Snow may not be placed in or adjacent to resource areas. So this is slightly different than what we said before. Before we sort of gave them an out that they could either have a snow storage area or they had to truck it off. And this is more that it has to be within the approved snow area. Is anybody I don't concerned know that by that's that? True. I, I don't know that it's true, actually. Um, oh, okay. Because if E18 e doesn't apply, if you don't store the snow on site, it would have been trucked right. away. So the implication is if you're storing, okay. see what I mean? So it seems to me it would work. Yep. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, so just to that point, I think you could say sh uh, snow um, may only be stored within the areas on the property um, on designated on the approved plans. And to the extent then that it exceeds the capacity, it shall be removed. So because when you say snow shall be stored, there is some sense, although it doesn't actually... Mm -hmm. It's not logical if you think about it, but it does almost indicate that it has to be stored there. And so I would just suggest that you could say snow may only be stored within the areas of the property designated on the approved plans. Actually, then, Roger, if you do that, then you can leave the the second stance then st still works just the way it's written. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. <clears throat> I felt to speak. Adding the for that purpose, just to clarify where on the site the snow may only be stored within the areas of the property designated for that purpose on the approved plans. Okay. This is noise from construction. All right. So the applicant should apply with all applicable local and state federal requirements. Uh, I think we have to see here. Well, the auction is great, but long energy that has waived because the technically the hours of construction are included in the noise abatement bylaw. Applicant responsible for sweeping, removal of snow, and sanding of the internal roadways and driveways, providing access. Uh, snow. And sanding of the internal roadways. Driveways. walkways does is this clear that they need to to clear the sidewalk as well or should we list that separately uh 
Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I, I'm all in favor of saying things like that separately because you, I, I, I imagine that they're that they are the property owner or the, or the condo association are required by town law to clear the sidewalks, uh, just the way all of us are. Uh, right. But yeah. it's it's not that rare to come across folks that don't do it, and this is a somewhat. I mean, it's an area that you want to make sure that it's done. So. It seems to me that if it's belt and suspenders, that's fine if it helps keep your pants up. Okay. Shall maintain all portions of any public road, whether state or local roads, used for the access to the property, free from soil and water during construction. Comply with DPW requirements regarding curb cut permits. And then this one we went back and forth with them. Uh, to the extent earth removal is necessary, the applicant shall prepare an earth removal plan showing all necessary cuts and fills and describing the number of truck trips necessary for the earth removal. Copy the plan to be kept on file at the job site. Um, there's a note here about the applicant proposes language to exempt earth removal associated with construction of footings and foundation walls. Um, I guess the question is, do we want to maintain this condition or modify it? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. For, for those of us who are just lawyers who don't really understand what's involved here, what actually would be the reason for exempting uh, or exempting earth removal associated with construction of footings and foundations. What's, what would be the ra rationale for that? My sense is that they, so the, the reason for this is that it provides us with the knowledge of the number of truck trips they're intending are gonna be required to remove earth from the site. Um, and they know they're going to have to remove earth in order to put in the footings in the foundation walls. They'll stockpile fill, but they're going to be moving stuff off site. It sounds like they just don't want to go through the process of having to figure out how many trips are necessary. Um, I don't see this being particularly burdensome because you know, determining the volume that they're going to remove in order to put the foundations and the footings in. And then comparing that to the size of a truck is a fairly straightforward calculation. Um, what are all the necessary cuts and fills? What's that about? But I don't think there are very specific about what aspect of this. So cuts are where you're removing soil and fills is where you're placing them. Because often what will happen on a site is you're going to be taking soil from one place and putting it somewhere else on the site. So it may end up being that you don't take any, any materials off site because you're taking it from one end and moving it to the other. Um, and so really what this is doing is saying that they need to figure out how much soil they're taking off site and termination, but they don't even have to, according to this, they don't even have to report it. Um, Mr. Chair, I wonder if what they're getting yeah. at is you know, I wonder if they're what they're asking is that if they rough grade the site, you know, to place the the slab, that they would do the the necessary earth removal of any pieces after the cut and fill, mm -hmm. 
at that time. And then they'll come back to do, you know, to, to dig the footings. Uh, and that's why they're trying to break this up. But, but I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily burdensome to ask them uh, to include that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could also just say to the extent earth removal is necessary, the applicant shall prepare an earth removal plan showing all necessary cuts and fills, period. And just removing, describing the number of truck trips necessary for the earth removal. I guess I I defer to the the others of you yeah. who are experts at all of this, but I'm like struggling at this to figure point, out from perspective what provides us at all. May I ask was was the intent um, to limit the is the intent to limit the number of truck truck trips or? Um, I I think that the intent is to just quantify, so that the board has in in the town has a sense in terms of what the earth removal that's going to be necessary for the project will look like. Hmm. I, I mean, I, I get where they're coming from. They're basically trying to say that it's going to be a just de minimis impact because, you know, it's only addressing earth removal necessary, you know, for the footings and foundation walls, and that's not going to be a significant amount. Um, but on the flip side, I also don't think it's a particularly significant burden on them to provide it. I mean, for this project, it's going to be fairly incidental, but, you know, for other projects, it could be, you know, we could be talking tens or hundreds of trucks. And it would probably become burdensome, but here I don't see there would be a situation where it would become burdensome. Yeah, I, I also could see, you know, with the installation of the, the um, groundwater system, that the, there could be a good amount of Earth removal required to to place that system in. So, okay. I'm pretty sure the terms bound and incidental. I added when we did this on the 25th. Um, incidental, I think, because we felt that it was going to be an incidental amount, but I'm not really sure what I meant by bound. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, do we lose Christian? Paul? Oh. Sorry, what was that? Oh, you, your screen has gone blank. I wasn't sure if we lost you or not. Oh. Nope. Am I, am I back? Nope. I see you. Really? Well, okay. That may be a picture. It's not blank for me, but okay. it's not moving either. Well, you but can't you trust can't... you can't trust me because I couldn't figure out how to get my sound <laughs> working early. So, so you, you don't see the screen. I'll rely on everyone else. I see the I... picture. I can see I have a blank screen. screen. First. I think I think the system is telling us it's getting tired and it's, it's <laughs> time to go. <laughs> Funny you should raise that, Pat. Oh, like, like So can you not see my screen at all anymore? No, you, we can see we can see the screen right, itself. I we'll can't see you, doing it. your face, except for right. well, now you've disappeared altogether. <laughs> He's gone. Well, I'm out of here then. If, <laughs> uh, as the you. vice chair, I guess I can entertain a motion to adjourn. Right. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, we need a quorum though. Do we need him for that? Or are we good? We still have no, a quorum. I think we've, we've got yeah. a quorum. All right. It seems disloyal, however, to do that. <laughs> Will he have trouble getting back in because of the time? I don't know. That happened That's to me. Good question. One, that happened to me one time. Do you know what the what the end? What do we have on the, as the end time in our? Thing? I think it said eleven. Yeah, it's eleven thirty. We're not that late then. I'd rather not go that late either. Well, I I was thinking get through E perhaps and then because we're if we're coming back for a second meeting. May as well have something to do. He just texted. He's trying to get back in. Okay. Let's take this opportunity to make a quick bathroom break. Okay. <sighs> Is that... Oh my gosh. Zoom actually has this until 11.30, which I'm pretty confident we won't have a quorum then. Huh. Your photo is showing up, Christian, if you can hear. I can see me. I can't see anybody else. <laughs> we can hear you. Anybody hear me? Yes. Yes. But uh, your your uh, screen is I, no longer shared. If I try to share this, okay. It's my. My still it says my screen share is low. Christian, when you disappeared, we did discuss mutiny and the possibility of adjourning without you. Okay, excellent. Uh, excellent. But but Pat Pat <laughs> stood up for you, so Nobody else volunteered to be chair? <laughs> well, right. I, well, I think under the circumstances, good, we're having enough difficulties now that- No, apparently I'm screen I, sharing. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I, I agree that this is probably the right time to come up with when we're gonna meet, and, meet again and not push the, uh, push our luck tonight. We're almost at ten thirty. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, go, looking at our calendar, we have a meeting on the sixteenth. Um, we have another one on the twenty third. We have one on the twenty third. I don't think we have anything currently on the eighteenth. Um, and we do have to wrap up by the June 4th is our, right. is the date. Um, well, given where we are, is it a fair assumption that so we, we certainly will get through the rest of the conditions 
ready. We need to go to Jay. There are not that many for a whole meeting. We should be able to yeah. do that. And then how much do we, after we've done that, there's a certain amount of pulling it all together. But it looks to me as if we've done enough tonight that if we yeah. insist on it, we will finish next time and well before the date expires. I don't know if Paul Paul's back. I, I, I'm right. going back and forth between my calendar, yep. so I don't know who's yes. available. I am back. Fantastic. So we have the option of um, if we want to stick with Thursdays, we could do the 18th or the 25th. Um, we would also have Monday the 22nd should also be available because, gosh willing, town meeting's over by then. Um, available on the 18th and the 25th, they are not what, available on the 27th. What date seems to work better for people? Person, okay. I'm, I'm available on the 18th and the 25th. I am not available on the 22nd. Okay. Do we want to go for the 18th then? Does that work for everyone? It works for me. I can do that. Yeah. And you know, personally, I would night. prefer the 25th, but okay, be, just because in the early... We could also go the, with the 25th. That's perfectly fine. I would go along with others. It's just... The 25th the, the is slightly bad for me. So... Right. So if we go with the 25th, uh, we always have the option of Tuesday the 30th as a possible backup. If we need it, Paul, would the twenty would the thirtieth work for you? If as a backup date, if we had to, I'm good on thirtieth. Okay. All right, Mr. Chair, I I can um, I have another public meeting before uh, this on the twenty fifth that will probably run until eight, so I may just be a couple minutes late if. If that's okay. Or we could start at eight if that made if that I mean I, I'm sure I could, you know, I could call it. I might just have a little bit of a divided attention for the, the first few minutes if <laughs> as long as that's all right. Oh, okay. All right. Paul, that wouldn't cause any problems, would it? I think that that, you know, he should be present for the entire meeting. Okay. So, I mean, you could start at eight. Okay. That, that should work for me. Okay. So then we would be looking to continue to Thursday, May, week 25th right at 8 p.m and then we have in our back pocket should we not complete on the 25th that we would go with tuesday the 30th okay so one thing I'd like to remind us of is that we have another 40B that's going on at the same time. And we'll yep. be meeting the next time on that one on the 16th. Um, and I think that right. just so you know, the applicant would like to present on transportation on that one. So that's what took, is the main thing to look forward to, that and administrative things. We're in the process of working out uh, getting some assistance as a for a yeah, peer review consultant and we'll probably want to make sure that that is done before we have the meeting after the 16th. But it's not going to be Miller time after this one is over. We've, we've, we've still got some more stuff to do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we're able to do that in, yeah. in two or three meetings rather than as many as we've had on this one. But we are going into the summertime and I'm going to eventually need from you uh, what your schedules are and when you can be available. and all of the Thursdays that we're talking about right now are days yeah. that might have been used in the other case too. So 
uh, once we get fixed what we need to do to get this one out of the way, we should be thinking about how we can move forward in an orderly but quick way on the other one. All right, so I will, um, so I can either take a first stab at trying to clean up the word file as we just worked on it tonight, or I could pass it off to, to Paul. What would be your preference, Paul? Changes as you made them, so definitely defer to you. Okay, all right, so I'll take a first pass at cleaning it up, and then I'll redistribute it to everyone, uh, so we all have that ahead of the 25th. All right. And if we have various typos that are not worth talking about, do we send them to you, Christian, or to Paul? Um, you can send them to me for now. Okay. I'll get those wrapped in. Great. Well, unless there's anything else, I will entertain a, uh, a motion to continue. So it's to a date certain of June 25th, right? Or May 25th. May 25th. Yep. Uh, so, so moved. Second. Okay. Does the vote of the board to continue the meeting for 1021 1027 Massachusetts Avenue to Thursday, May 25th at 8 p.m.? Vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Mr. Blank. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on 1021-1027 Massachusetts Avenue until a week from Thursday. So two weeks from tonight. Um, so there's nothing else on our docket for tonight. So I thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank Colleen Ralston for assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It is our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. In a second. Oh, uh, second. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. DuPont. Everyone wants to just stay on the call. We're having too much fun. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Cadelli. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. I will get you copy for this and uh, see you all on Tuesday. Have a good, good night, night everyone. Thanks. Good night everybody. Good night. Good night.